First, let's take a quick look at the hydraulic circuit and the power-assisted CHPS of the 5FG series. The oil tank. The oil pump. The flow divider. The oil control valve. The lift cylinder. The tilt cylinder. And return circuit. These are the load handling components in the hydraulic circuit. The CHPS includes the following components in its power assisting circuit. Brake master cylinder. Brake wheel cylinder. Clutch master cylinder. Clutch release cylinder. Steering gear box. and power steering cylinder. This is the hydraulic circuit in the power-assisted CHPS. Two to three ton series clutch type models having the 4Y or 1Z engine have a tandem oil pump in their hydraulic circuit. The entire hydraulic circuit is divided into two circuits. One for load handling and power steering, and the other for the brakes and the clutch. In this video, we will study the CHPS as used on a forklift truck having the tandem oil pump. This is the tandem oil pump. And this is the main pump that provides pressurized oil for load handling and for power steering. This is the sub-pump that provides pressurized oil for the brakes and the clutch. We will now see how the pressurized oil from these oil pumps works. Now we will concentrate on the hydraulic circuit for load handling and power steering. First, the load handling circuit. Oil in the oil tank is pressurized by the oil pump, which is the power source of the hydraulic circuit. The pressurized oil goes to the flow divider and enters the oil control valve. The oil control valve has a relief valve to maintain the pressurized oil under constant pressure. The oil control valve determines the passage through which the pressurized oil is permitted to travel. Is directed by the oil control valve toward the lift cylinder or the tilt cylinder and causes the lift or tilt cylinder to function. Oil used in the lift or tilt operation and any unused oil is returned to the oil tank through the return circuit. Oil is also returned to the oil tank through the return circuit even if the control valve is never operated. Next, we will look at the hydraulic circuit for power steering. 
oil is pressurized by the oil pump and travels through the flow divider. The passage after the flow divider is determined by the oil control valve, located in the steering gear box, which moves according to the steering wheel operation. The pressurized oil enters the power steering cylinder and performs its intended function. Oil used in the power steering operation and any unused oil is returned to the oil tank through the return circuit. Let's study about the flow divider now in some detail. The flow divider is inside the oil control valve. Normally, to operate the load handling devices and power steering, two oil pumps are necessary. But several systems may be controlled by only one oil pump if it's assured that the operation of one system does not affect the proper amount of oil required for other systems. This assurance is provided by the flow divider. It is designed to direct oil to two passages in appropriate amounts at a junction in the hydraulic circuit. The flow divider consists mainly of the piston, steel ball, and spring. This diagram shows their positions when the engine is not operating. When the engine cranks and the oil pump begins to send oil through the circuit, the pressurized oil flows through orifice A and enters the piston. It pushes the steel ball open and enters the power steering circuit. As the engine speed increases and the oil pump sends more oil to the flow divider, more pressurized oil goes through orifice B and enters the left side of the piston. And it pushes the piston to the right and opens a hydraulic circuit connected to the load handling circuit. When the engine speed decreases, the piston is then pushed back to the left, closing the opening to the load handling circuit, but keeps supplying the necessary amount of oil to the power steering circuit. If something is preventing the smooth operation of the load handling devices, the oil passage for loading and unloading remains open. If the lift or tilt device is operated at the same time as the steering operation in a situation like this, some oil still keeps flowing to the load handling circuit and only a small amount of oil reaches the power steering circuit. This will cause dragging of the steering wheel and extra effort will be needed to operate it. We will look at the brake and clutch circuits next. First, the brake circuit. The pressurized oil from the sub pump goes to the flow divider located inside the brake master cylinder and enters the master cylinder to reduce the brake pedal operating effort. Unused oil returns to the oil tank through the return circuit. Let's look at the clutch circuit next. The flow of pressurized oil from the sub pump is divided by the flow divider in the brake master cylinder. It travels through the flow divider located in the clutch master cylinder and enters the master cylinder to reduce the clutch pedal operating effort. Unused oil returns to the oil tank through the return circuit. This completes the explanation about the flow of oil in the power-assisted CHPS.
Now we will study the brake system in the power assisted CHPS. Old model forklifts of the 4FG series had a full power type CHPS in which each wheel cylinder was operated directly by the pressurized oil from the oil pump. In the power assisted CHPS, the pressurized oil from the oil pump is used to reduce the brake pedal operating effort and hydraulic pressure necessary to operate the wheel cylinder is provided by the master cylinder piston. Therefore, the brake master cylinder is different in design and operation from the brake valve found in the conventional full power type CHPS. This is the brake master cylinder in the power assisted CHPS. This is the flow divider. This is the master cylinder piston. And this is the power piston that assists the braking power. We will now study the construction and operation of the flow divider in the brake master cylinder. This shows the inner component layout of the flow divider. It consists of the flow divider spool and the spring. When the engine is not running, the flow divider spool is at the left of the stroke. When the engine cranks, oil enters the flow divider through the entrance. It travels through the orifice, enters the right side of the flow divider spool, and flows into the brake master cylinder. At the same time, oil flows through another orifice and enters the left side of the flow divider spool. As a result, the flow divider spool moves to the right and opens an oil passage, so that oil also reaches the clutch master cylinder. This shows the condition of the flow divider spool immediately after the engine is started. As the engine speed increases and more oil is sent to the flow divider, a large amount of oil enters the left side of the flow divider spool also. Therefore, the flow divider spool moves further to the right. The spool movement reduces the oil passage leading to the brake master cylinder. In this way, the flow divider makes sure that only the necessary amount of oil enters the brake master cylinder. This shows the inner component layout of the power piston. As you can see here, it contains the control valve, seat control valve, reaction piston number two, and reaction piston. We will look at the components in more detail through these diagrams. This is the control valve. This is the seat control valve. This is reaction piston number two. And this is the reaction piston. Let's see how the brake master cylinder functions. When the brake pedal is not pressed, the pressurized oil from the flow divider travels through the booster power chamber, through a gap between the control valve and the seat control valve, and enters into the power piston body. 
Then it returns to the oil tank. When the brake pedal is pressed, the reaction piston is pushed by the push rod and moves to the left. At the same time, it causes the seat control valve to move to the left via the spring. As a result, the passage is closed. However, as oil continues to enter, hydraulic pressure increases inside the power piston and the booster power chamber. The power piston also moves to the left because of the difference in pressure areas as the reaction piston moves to the left. At this time, the servo ratio is determined by the ratio of the area of this portion of the reaction piston to the area of this portion of the power piston. Now, let's go back to the explanation regarding operation. As the power piston moves to the left, it causes the master cylinder piston to move to the left. Now, let's look at the left end of the master cylinder piston. you will find a valve at the piston's end. The valve, which was pushed open by the pin, is now pushed to the right by the spring as the master cylinder piston moves to the left. As a result, the passage is closed. The oil in the master cylinder opens the outlet valve and enters the wheel cylinder to apply the brake. Now, let's see what will happen if the brake pedal is held down. The pressurized oil keeps flowing into the power piston. As such, hydraulic pressure in the power piston rises further. The higher hydro pressure pushes the seat control valve and moves it to the right and opens the passage. Since the passage is now open, oil is returned to the oil tank so that the pressure inside the booster power chamber does not rise higher than necessary. When the brake pedal is released, the reaction piston moves to the right. The seat control valve moves to the right also. And the oil passage is opened as a result. Therefore, oil in the booster power chamber returns to the tank through the oil passage and the pressure inside the chamber decreases as a result. The piston retainer spring pushes the master cylinder piston and the power piston to the right. Oil from the wheel cylinder pushes up the outlet valve and returns to the master cylinder. As the pressure in the brake pipeline decreases, the outlet valve is closed by the spring so that the residual pressure is maintained in the brake pipeline. When the master cylinder piston returns all the way to the original position, the valve at the tip is pushed by the pin and opens the passage again. This allows the replenishment of oil into the cylinder so that the minimum amount of necessary oil is maintained at all times. Now, let's see what will happen when the brake pedal is pressed suddenly. The reaction piston moves to the left quickly. Together, the seat control valve and the control valve move to the left.
As a result, this passage is closed. And the other passage is opened. Therefore, oil enters the power chamber from two inlets simultaneously. And the pressure inside the power chamber rises rapidly. The quick rise of pressure prevents any delay in braking action in an emergency. The power-assisted CHPS is designed so that the brake can function properly even when the oil pump is not working. When the brake pedal is pressed, the reaction piston directly pushes the power piston. It also pushes the master cylinder piston. In this case, the brake requires two to three times greater braking effort because of the absence of assisting power. This completes the explanation on the construction and operation of the brake master cylinder. You have learned that proper power assistance is not obtained when foreign material is clogging the seat control valve or the reaction piston, thus preventing their smooth movement thereby causing greater brake operating effort under such conditions. The clutch master cylinder is exactly the same as the brake master cylinder in terms of construction and operation. The only difference is that the clutch master cylinder does not have an outlet valve at its exit, since the clutch does not need a residual pressure in the pipeline. We hope you are now more familiar about the difference between the power-assisted CHPS of the 5FG series and the full-power type CHPS used on conventional forklift models, and that you have also fully understood the braking method of the power-assisted CHPS. Please use this video as a reference and refer to the service manuals and other publications for more detailed information.